I definitely think that we do have a white curriculum and I think when we discuss whether or not our curriculum is white, we also definitely are talking about a wider conversation on colonialism, post-imperialism, that kind of thing. And so not only is our curriculum white, but it's white from an imperialist time, white from a time when we didn't even have the most basic understanding of racial issues or post-colonial issues or anything like that. So I think these two things actually really go together and they really... Um, I think we definitely do. I think you see this in every single department. I've been at LSE for a year and a half and I've taken courses in three um, departments. Um, and I think in every single department they overwhelmingly have a white curriculum. Um, and that's funny, it's not just a British curriculum or an American curriculum, it's a white, um, very, very clearly white. You know, you have diversity in terms of where people are from. You have diversity if they're from America or they're from Holland, um, but it tends to be white. Which I think in itself is limiting. Um, a lot of the perspectives um, do take on the perhaps the British or the Eurocentric perspective, um, which I think also contributes to the idea of a white curriculum. Um, yeah, a lot of perspectives are missed out. And the Western perspective, the best part is it isn't shown as a perspective, it's just shown as what is the truth. Um, and that's the problem with the white curriculum, is showing something as the truth as opposed to a perspective. And that's definitely what LSE has. Uh, yeah, like most of my modules are based on um, politics and economic policy, based on like European countries. But I don't see a, a massive issue with that because at the end of the day, it's, it's just a course that like we have what, 20 weeks of teaching in a year. Um, so what, 20 hours of lectures. That's by all means not the whole subject body. So um, if anything, it's just a flavor of the subject that you get tested on. It doesn't mean to say that there isn't um, different perspectives in different areas of the world, like be it Asia, Middle East, Africa. Um, so if, if someone was interested in finding out more, then the onus I would say is on them to explore further. And often um, lecturers and class teachers are not opposed to people bringing in like um, things that aren't on the reading list or things that aren't necessarily part of the course um, as an outside perspective but I think maybe that needs to be made more clear um, so that people know that okay this isn't like the normative thing here this isn't the, the only thing about this course that can be taught there are other perspectives outside of it. Um, I think in general the UK does have a white curriculum like from what I remember um, in my sort of learning experiences in the past I've always kind of learned things from a very white perspective all my readings everything has kind of come from white men generally but um, at LSE I've kind of noticed it a little bit more um, I study international relations and I found that that is very Eurocentric and even in past papers the question comes up is I are Eurocentric um, so I think the fact is that the university itself acknowledges that this is a very Eurocentric course in the way that it's taught but the thing is like why is nothing happening about it why 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 isn't the course being changed um, I think it's it's especially um, a problem considering that the LSE advertises explicitly that you know we have 150 nationalities represented on campus um, but this ex this experience isn't translated into our curriculum it's not w in what we're taught um, the same you know multicultural pluralism is not reflected in in the IR department syllabus it's not reflected in the history of what we're taught um, I remember in first year we had to do a basic course um, HI116 concept of international society um, and you look at concepts like empire and on the reading list there would not be a single person from from a former colony or someone who is a core thinker of the post-colonial movement and someone who critiques empire um, and if there was someone who was critiquing empire it'd be someone from the west um, and essentially this Euro-American hegemony of the way we see the world and how we're taught to think is problematic um, some of us who aren't from the west just don't don't feel comfortable and we don't feel like there's a place for us within academia if it's obviously shutting us out I mean the core the distinction between the core and the periphery is, is was essential to how empire functioned and that, that distinction no longer exists. You cannot deny us and you cannot erase us, you cannot silence us anymore when we're physically sat in your classrooms. So in meeting international history, I think it's a case of you question actually the validity of calling it international, you know, just call it history, because you can't justify calling it international if the only international elements you have are, you know, post 20th century and anything before that it's a case of, oh no, this is, this is just 
solely focused on, on the Western countries. Because for me, for example, doing history and taking the historiography course, I'm there questioning, like, okay, you're talking about Romanka and, and the Annales School, and you're not actually discussing the many, many other scholars of history throughout the whole world that have contributed to the creation of history. Um, so me growing up as a Muslim and learning about Islamic history, I was confused when I went to university and you know, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to be learning about all these other different scholars who, for me, I kind of associated with the creation of history and the creation of a school of thought. Um, and it was completely different. So I think that's something that really needs to be addressed. Can we justify labelling ourselves as something new and something on the verge of really breaking barriers and being international when actually we're still very much set in a traditional mindset? We, we perhaps learn about the world, but we, we learn about it in a way that reflects the perspectives of those who've, who've, who've either recorded their history or drawn up the economic models or like thought up the economic theory. And that shapes the way in which, in which we interpret the knowledge that we're receiving. And, and I think, to be honest, even if, even if like objectively I, I oppose that, like that would honestly be fine if we were made aware of the fact that these knowledges are situated in the first place, you know, but we're not. We're not. Um, yeah, I think that whiteness as a thing has been largely ignored within society and especially within our curriculum. Um, I think that it starts at a really young age where everything is almost whitewashed. Um, being someone from Arab descent, I, th I think I did notice this when we were doing sort of World War I, World War II studies in history, and you have 1.3 million Indian soldiers missing from a World War I narrative, which is really, really damaging, especially when you think of British identity and what that represents. It's very much white. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Australia um, to do study abroad for six months, which was really, really eye-opening in terms of whiteness studies. Um, I was able to do a course called Racial Literacy, and this completely opened my eyes to the social construction of our racialized world. Um, and it was actually really liberating, because once you understand that something like um, the other or whiteness is constructed and it's centralized to be normal and transparent within our society, then you can be begin to understand that actually we're, we shouldn't be marginalised and we, we can have the power to change things like that and change our curriculum. So um, at, at the LSC, um, our curriculum definitely is uh, Eurocentric and I think it's a real shame, especially studying social policy here, um, not having a wide enough plethora especially when it comes to understanding ways in which society sustain themselves. Uh, when we look at the family unit, uh, obviously here um, we have the neoliberal idea of um, the nuclear family. However, I think understanding of how societies have worked and developed over time, and also how societies perhaps work in the future, uh, would really be enriching if we could have a much more broad, um, holistic understanding of the different ways in which societies have worked, um, not just a, um, the Eurocentric model. Definitely, I think not a day goes by when you're in class that you don't see elements of a curriculum which is tailored around the interests of white people, around the history of white people, or indeed around um, the discourse of the white man essentially being correct, all-knowing and all-knowledgeable, whereas people from the Orient are described as being, you know, the other or coming out with a discourse that challenges prevailing narratives. So in that regard, we're always pitted as, you know, being the antithesis to um, rationality, essentially. So I think it's easy to discern that we do have a white curriculum. Um, a white curriculum that whitewashes history, for example, when we think of ancient Egypt, we seem to think of, um, you know, sort of white people um, within, within that history when actually there's overwhelming evidence to show that they were black people, obviously, in ancient Egypt. To give that narrative definitely implies that um, all civilised history and all in the incredible history that we have in the world is predominantly a white history. And I think this is very, very disempowering for people who have a missing context from their own histories and the amazing work that their, their own identities and their own heritage has accomplished. For example, when I look at Iraq, if someone looks at Iraq now, you know, it's almost as if we have no history. The only history that the white man has created is of war and violence and destruction. But actually, if you look before the 1900s, it was blooming with literature and maths and science and art. And, you know, this history of Babylon as well, it's, it's very much missing from the narrative. And I think it was, you know, 
a campaign by the colonial powers um, to decivilize, and I think that that disempowering nature has continued until today. It bothers me because it's there's a sense that's missing from our from what we're learning. There's something that's missing. Um, for example, when I was at Penn State, I had this one class. It was this um, South African politics class, and the professor was South African, and she had lived through the apartheid. And so during the class, like she showed us, she lifted her skirt and showed us the bullet wounds on her legs when she was talking about refugees, and she spoke about her own personal experience, and that gave a richness to the lesson that someone who was not South African, someone who had just read books and done um, case studies would not be able to give us that richness in the lesson. And so what bothers me about it is that we're missing out on something that people who have lived certain experiences can, can give us as students, or people um, can relate to the material that we're learning in a personal way when we're talking about, for example, representation in the media. And if we're talking about that and it's taught by a white male who can never really fully understand what it is as a black female to be misrepresented in the media, despite how much he's read it and researched it, it's very different and a little less um, fulfilling when he hasn't lived it himself. And um, there's that disconnect, I feel like, between the text and the person. And that's what bothers me about it, that we could do more to improve the education by having diversity. So, yeah, in my experience, um, so I'm a philosophy student, um, and I feel like basically everything that I study is the work of white men and the contributions of women and of people of color are just like marginalized and diminished. Um, and like, so I, uh, I did a module, part of which was on race. And the only, like all the readings that we were set were written by white men. And so it was this white man teaching me what other white men have said about race. <laughs> and you know racism and racial relations and art. So I think this goes back to some of the stuff I was saying earlier about this impression that we seem to have that we are really academically rigorous and that we're somehow objective and that we somehow base everything on objective non-subjective fact and you know none of it's relative none of it you know. Um, and so if we want to have that as something that we claim academia is, then we can't say we're going to have a UK or Anglo-based curriculum because it's not true to the truth of the world as a whole. Now, if we want to have this UK-based, Anglo-based thing, and, you know, perhaps there are those who have arguments for it, I'm not one of them, but if that was really the case, then at the very least, we ought to be a little bit more honest about it. We really then ought to just flat out say, yes, we do have a really Anglo-centric curriculum. No, we're not going to have all of this academic elitism. We're not going to have all of this superiority and saying that really these are the theories and the ideas and the books that we are going to read because they are objectively better, because they are objectively more academically rigorous. But you just can't have both of these things at the same time. Our narrative and discourse, essentially, to understand powerlessness and empowerment, you need to understand what power and powerlessness actually is. White privilege can be something as simple as, you know, walking into a shop and not being suspected of potentially being a shoplifter, but white privilege in this situation, in this circumstance, can mean something as simple as walking into a university lecture theatre, seeing a lecturer who looks like you, resembles you, shares your values, your history, and actually asserts these and puts these out to be fact in class, that's a form of power, uh, of uh, empowering someone. And for us to be excluded from that narrative really does um, aggravate our powerlessness in society and it really does serve to do nothing but exclude us from all prevailing narratives. Part of white privilege is the fact that it, fr it hinges on exclusion. So, for, so to exclude our histories, our narratives and all of this discourse from what we, be, what we are being taught at university, that really does nothing productive in combating the white privilege which has for centuries oppressed people of a darker skin tone or people from the Orient. 
So in that regard, it does really matter and it does need to be challenged because if we don't do something about it, we'll essentially be coerced into conforming, we'll be coerced into ameliorating all of our identity, all of our history, and essentially be subservient to the prevailing norm, which is constructed around the interests of the white male archetype. Well, um, basically, I'm from Australia and my whole life, um, I lived in a very white area in Australia and my whole life people keep telling me Porvija stop playing the race card, Porvija stop playing the race card this, these issues don't like exist, these issues don't exist it might not exist to them but it exists to people of colour and I'm, I'm often accused of always playing the race card um, and basically to, to rephrase or um, Hari Kondabolu's quote to say that I'm obsessed with racism in Australia is to say that I'm obsessed with swimming while I'm drowning. So when you have the president of the French Republic, Sarkozy, going to a university in Senegal, an African university, and saying, and, and saying literally, it is a tragedy that the African has not yet entered history. Like, what the, what is that? I swear. It's, it's absolute rubbish. It's, it's, I find it so repulsive. And, and like, the thing is, we don't, I mean, sorry to make it so Africa-centric, but like, there is so much that we don't learn because, because, because I think we just we just don't learn it. And like number one, that's problematic. First of all, but it makes sense that like when 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 no one's paying attention to to the structures that like are responsible for this mess in the first place, of course we don't learn about it, you know? People have suggested that because of the fact and virtue that we're in Britain, our curriculum should accordingly be Eurocentric. I vehemently disagree with that notion. I think to instill these so-called British values in our curriculum would run contrary to all notions of justice and equality. If Eurocentricism is to be propagated, what is Eurocentricism? The fact that it's colonised a third of the world, that's Britain alone, not even Europe. A third of the world has been colonised, subjugated to their values, whereby it's internalized this self-hate it's internalized this whole idea that you know europe is always correct europe is the standard of beauty europe is the standard of education that all of us should strive for so i think that we should definitely start campaigning at uni um, to bring in more lecturers from uh, BME backgrounds. Um, it's definitely empowering to students to see that their lecturers are teaching subjects, for example, on Africa from African descent. Um, and I think that this should then ripple out into secondary schools and primary schools especially because um, race is something that is instilled within us from a very, very young age. and. And I think it's, it's very important to make people aware of the social constructs from, from a young age um, in order to give them the, the liberation effect, if I call it that, um, and to, to empower BME students to be able to know that you know, they, they can go on and, and achieve things. So to fix the Eurocentric nature of our curriculum, I think we could do a number of things. I think firstly, uh, we could seek to make sure that you know, in all of the courses there's a wider spectrum of ideas and where even if we're not you know taught about them in depth that we're made aware that there are other competing ideas and ways in which things have been done across the globe. I think secondly uh, we could actively encourage you know the idea of dissent in class about different models and actually have competing theories and how they operate um, across the world and have done in the past. I think thirdly and possibly the most important thing is to have a wider variety of teaching members who have experiences from right across the globe. I mean you know most recently the LSE did an incredible scheme to bring on board over a hundred leading professors and lecturers from across the globe and yet from that entire number only one of them uh, was from actually outside of Europe and I think this is a massive shame and a massively missed opportunity to really enrich in the life um, of LSE's academic staff. Uh, I definitely think that we should try and fix it. I know that it's not going to be fixed overnight. I know it's something that's going to take a lot of time. Um, I, what I do not think we should do is just fix it based on looks so people think there's some kind of like quota that they need to have so two black people two indian three white and that is diversity um but i think we should focus on diversity of the mind in terms of experiences so if if we're acknowledging that our curriculum is white then i think we need to ask the question who is teaching the curriculum and if you look you'll find that it's generally white men uh, white middle-aged middle-class men and that that sort of is reflected in the contents of the course and the way that the readings are chosen because the readings tend to be white men and and there is there is difficulties when you're trying to relate to that as a woman of colour for example and, and it is a bit disengaging sometimes. I think it can be changed, I think we definitely have to work towards change, we can't accept it at all but 
I would actually say that the biggest change does have to happen, you know, primary school, secondary school, GCSE A level. I think it's as simple as getting our voices out there, getting more black and minority ethnic professors lecturing at universities like ours, the London School of Economics, and I think that is made harder, again, through white privilege, because we are in a situation as descendants of immigrants who have come here trying to establish ourselves in the society which by its very nature discriminates against us. So for us to assert ourselves in the role of the professors that are dominating the education um, world, we need to actually shake off this idea that the only way towards success is through entering the corporate world or is through entering the world of uh, vocational um, vocations.